Hello everyone, it's Scott, and we're back for day two of Murders at Carlock Manor. Spoilers, we've got just a few cards to talk about today, but some very powerful ones from today, I think, are going to have a lot of impact on Standard. So let's talk about the cards from today's previews. So first we've got Vanifar Evolved Enigma for two, a green and a blue mana. You get an Elf Ooze Wizard, that's a 3-4. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, you get to choose one. Cloak a card from your hand, put it onto the battlefield, face down as a 2-2 creature with Ward 2. Turn it face up any time for its mana cost if it's a creature, or put a plus one plus one counter on each colorless creature you control. So first, let's talk about the second ability there. We already have a creature artifact creature deck that is primarily in Simic colors right now. So I think that fits right into that deck as a very nice card to include that can grow your creatures every single turn. And we've seen cards like this before, um, like Luminarch Aspirant, and we've got other cards that are basically every turn they put a counter on something, and they see a lot of play in standard. So I think this card, if you're playing a deck that has mostly colorless creatures in it, I think that deck's going to definitely want this kind of card. Now also we've got the Cloak ability, which basically gets you to put a card down on the battlefield as a 2-2. So extra mana that you have lying around in your hand, maybe you, you got flooded a little bit, you can now give that cloaked and make it a 2-2. Or you could also have a 7 or 8 drop creature in your hand that you can't play right now, but if you, you'd like to get it on the battlefield, so you play it as a 2-2 temporarily, and then when you get to that point where you've got enough mana, then you flip it and it becomes this big threat that's on the board. So I think both of those options are certainly possible for a Vanifar. So I think this is going to be a card that people will try to build around in the coming standard season. Next, we've got Delaney Streetwise Lookout, a legendary creature that's a human scout and a 2-2 for three mana. Creatures you control with power two or less can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. So very interesting ability here. Um, and we've got a number of really, in essence, go under decks right now. Um, thinking about the Boros deck that's out there right now, it's mostly one and two power creatures. So I can see this easily fitting into that and making it hard for your opponent to block if they've got mostly three power or greater creatures because they wouldn't be able to block. So it's basically giving them the ability to go underneath those creatures. But also you have, if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. So I think this is really the part of the card that matters the most because we've got a lot of cards in standard that have two toughness or less that have triggered abilities. And because of that, I think you can build a deck around those triggered abilities that Delaney is going to double for you. So I think this may be one of the best cards potentially in the set if we can find the right build around for it. Um, and I don't know if it's going to be a, a white deck or if it's going to be a Boros deck, but I think there's definitely a deck out there where this is going to be a key part of and make that deck really powerful in standard. Next, we've got Intrude on the Mind for three and two blue mana. You get an instant that reveals the top five cards of your library and separate them into two piles. An opponent chooses one of those piles. Put that pile into your hand and the other cards into your graveyard. Create a zero zero color stop your artifact creature token with flying. Then put a plus one plus one counter on it for each card put into your graveyard this way. So our immediate thought with this one, it's a fact or fiction card. We've seen a lot of cards like this over the years where, you know, for around five mana, you get to draw about five or six cards and then you get to divide those into two piles and your opponent gets to choose one of them. Okay. Now this one, I think may be potentially the best of it because not only is it 
giving you those five cards to look at, but also it's happening at instant speed. And in addition to that, you're getting a body to put on the field that if you cast this during your opponent's combat step, well, now you've got a blocker that your opponent was not anticipating. And depending on how you stack the cards, you're going to have a two or three toughness and power creature that can now be a pretty effective blocker in that particular game. But also this can in some ways be a win condition for the deck because a lot of times you know, our contr blue control decks, whether it's Azorius control or something else, they don't really have a lot of creatures. And this is a way to get a creature onto the battlefield and do what you want to do anyways, which is draw cards. So I think this is going to see a good amount of standard play certainly in control decks, but even beyond that, because it creates that creature, I can see this finding a home in other decks as well that are going to have blue as one of their colors. Next, we've got Vein Ripper for three and three black mana. You get a Vampire Assassin with flying. That's a 6-5 and has Ward Sacrifice a Creature. And whenever a creature dies, target opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So a very powerful vampire here. The six mana is a thing that probably is going to limit its playability in standard because I can't see more than one or two copies of this at six mana making it into a deck. But because it's protected, okay, your opponent has to sacrifice a creature. So if you're playing against a opponent that's primary playing a control deck and they're relying on spot removal to get rid of things, well, they may not have a creature to sacrifice to go ahead and kill Vein Reaper. And also, whenever a creature dies, it doesn't matter which side, your opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So if, a, if this is on the board, your opponent uses a board wipe, well, they've lost a bunch of life and you gained a bunch of life from those cards that they killed in this particular decision that they made to wipe the board. So I think Vein, Vein Ripper has some playability in standard. Um, and I'm even thinking that we've already, we've got the um, Oni called Anvil deck that does sacrifice a lot of creatures. So maybe the top end of that deck, but that deck's getting really crowded at this point, but maybe the top end of that deck, one or two copies would be perfect. Late in the game, you play this, and then every whenever you're sacrificing a creature to only called Anvil, well, not only are you getting the Anvil's activation, but also you're getting Vein Ripper's activation as well. Next, we've got Case of the Stash Skeleton for one and a black mana. Whenever this case enters the battlefield, create a 2-1 black skeleton creature token and suspect it. To solve, you control no suspected skeletons, so that creature's got to die. Once it's solved, then you pay one, you may pay one in a black mana and sacrifice this case. Search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle. Activate only as a sorcery. Okay, so I think this is a powerful case for us because you get a two one for two mana. Okay, decent rate right there. And you use your skeleton to block something thus solving your case. And then on the next turn, you can pay two mana, sacrifice it, and go search your library for a card that you need at that particular moment. Now, is that a little bit of steps to jump through? Yes, but I think the ability to create a blocker that will then become a better card later in the game, I think is worth it. So I think black will definitely be trying this in standard. Next, we've got Assemble the Players for one and a white mana. You get an enchantment. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. Once each turn, you may cast a creature spell with power two or less from the top of your library. So nice ability if you're playing in a low to the ground creature deck, which allows you to play creatures from the top of your library. And the nice thing here it says is once each turn, not on your turn, but each turn. So you potentially can be playing cards on your opponent's turn as well as your own if you've got a creature with power two or less on top of your library. So it'll be interesting to see if that is something that will make Assemble the Players playable in standard because the two cost kind of taking a turn off doesn't sound like a good thing for white because white is generally a more aggressive 
deck right now in standard. So the question is, where does this fit in? Um, and we're going to kind of have to kind of see where it is going to find the right place. But I think there is a home for this somewhere in standard because once each turn, that's a pretty powerful ability, being able to play without, in essence, with flash, any creature off the top of your deck on your opponent's turn, that's two power or less. All right. Next, we've got Unyielding Gatekeeper. For one and a white mana, you get an Elfin Cleric. That's a 3-2. It has Disguise for one and a white mana. And you may cast this card face down for three mana as a 2-2 creature with Ward 2. Then turn it face up any time for its Disguise cost. When Unyielding Gatekeeper is turned face up, exile another target non-land permanent. If you're, you controlled it, return it to the battlefield tap. Otherwise, its controller creates a 2-2 white and blue detective creature token. So this is a card that's, in my mind, offensive and defensive. Because if you need to protect one of your creatures, maybe the best creature you've got, your opponent is targeting with spot removal. You've got this on the field. You've got two mana open. You go ahead and pay the disguise cost. Now it comes into play. You go ahead and exile the card that your opponent was targeting. And now that creature will return to the battlefield after it's been exiled. Then if it's your opponent's card you're targeting, they do get that 2-2 white and blue detective creature token, but you're probably taking out the most powerful thing on the opponent's side, like a Shialdron, and they don't have a way to get it back. Because it's not like if you kill Unyielding Gatekeeper, the exile card comes back. It's only if it's one of your creatures does it return to the battlefield or one of your permanents does it return to the battlefield. So I think this is an interesting card that we're going to see people try to use in standard. The question is, where does it fit right? Because right now, if we think about what we've got in white, it's, it's mono white humans or it's soldiers. And this doesn't necessarily fit into one of those two builds. So maybe a different kind of deck will form around this card that will be used our played in standard. Next we've got Pyrotechnic Performer for one and a red mana. You get a VS, you know, Assassin. That's a 3-2. So good power, good toughness for two cost. It has disguise and you can pay one mana to reveal it. And you may cast this card face down for three as a 2-2 creature with Ward 2. Turn it face up at any time for its disguise cost. When Pyrotechnic Performer or another creature you control is turned face up, that creature deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. So I, I like this card assuming we have a disguise deck because this is going to be a, really a disguise payoff where any card you're either using disguise on or you're using cloak on, when you turn the card over, then you're going to deal damage directly to your opponent. And that direct damage in a mono red deck or an is it deck or any number of other decks could be just what you need to beat your opponent. So I think this has got a place in standard. It's just going to be finding the right deck to put it in. Next, we've got Steam Core Scholar for two and a blue mana. You get a weird detective. That's a 2-2. Two, two. It has flying and vigilance. And when Steam Core Scholar enters the battlefield, draw two cards, then discard two cards unless you discard an instant or sorcery card or a creature card with flying. So for three mana, good card because you get to draw two and then either you're going to discard two and more likely you're going to discard one in that situation so i think this is definitely standard playable in a you know any base blue deck that we're seeing you know is this a four of probably not but that again that added card draw is something that can really matter in standard so i think this is definitely something that is playable Next, we've got a couple lower rarity cards I want to talk about to end our day. First, we've got Buried in the Garden for two, a green and a white mana. You get an enchantment. That's an aura. And you get to enchant land. When Buried in the Garden enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent you don't control until Buried in the Garden leaves the battlefield. 
Whenever enchanted land is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional one mana of any color. So we're getting the traditional white enchantment that exiles a creature, or in this case, any non-land permanent. But we also get the upside in green of adding one additional mana every time you tap that land that this is enchanting. So I like the combination of this. Now, is this a four of index? Probably not, but it's certainly, I think, a good sideboard option and certainly could be main deckable in the right build. Finally, our last card of the day is Private Eye. For one, a white and a blue mana, you get a Hunculus Detective, that's a 3-3, and other detectives you control get plus one, plus one. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, target detective can't be blocked this turn. So we've got, a, in essence, a Lord for detectives. So I think this has potential, obviously, for playability in Standard. The fact that it's three mana and not two makes it a little bit harder. But if we do have some kind of detective deck that develops, I think Private Eye might be just the card it needs to help push it into playability in Standard. All right, that's day two of Spoilers for Murders at Carlisle Manor. I'll be back tomorrow with day three of spoilers, and you can take a look here at our spoilers from day one and our previews that go back to the early access or early event in December that looks at the first set of cards that were released from Murders at Carlop Manor. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow.